and I'm a teacher and a writer from Ohio. And I happened to be a passenger in a car going over a bridge for a city's water supply in Ohio. And I saw something along the shoreline that looked very large, very wide. It was holding onto a tree. I got a pretty good look at it for a few seconds. You know, it takes maybe maybe 20 seconds to get across the bridge but when I was closest to it I was still about a football field away so when people ask me if I've had a sighting of Bigfoot I say I don't know but that is what got me interested in this because I was just a school teacher I you know I was aware of Bigfoot but thought Bigfoot was a myth and there was just one of them and kind of like Santa Claus like we were talking about earlier and I never it never occurred to me that it could be a real creature and that there could be more than one of them so that's how I originally started reading I saw that there were reports of other people seeing these creatures right in the same area there were several reports in the same area I started googling things I started reading I started going to hear people speak about this and I would say, you know, it's been very life-changing for me because I spend really more time with Bigfoot research between I'm writing a book, I travel, I put a lot of money, of my own money into this, I speak different places, I do a lot of things with kids. Um, I just, it's changed my life because I want to know what's out there. I want to know what it is that I saw. Since that original possible sighting, I met different people that were interested in the same topic and started to learn from them. I joined a group or was asked to be in a group of Bigfoot researchers in about 2015 after spending some time with them and, you know, getting to know a little bit about what they did. And um, flash forward a few years after that, I was asked to be, I, I was thinking of going by myself, you know, doing my own thing. I started something um, called Amy's Bucket List Expeditions, where I do things with Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and libraries and things like that, just to share, you know, my passion for this and to get kids out in nature. I became an Ohio certified volunteer naturalist so that I could learn more about what isn't Bigfoot in the forest, what other animals do their behaviors and things like that and I started taking bushcraft classes so that I wasn't just sitting there with my little Duraflame log but I could actually make a fire and and you know take care of myself out outdoors so a few years after the first group when I decided to kind of go on my own I was asked to join the Olympic project which is something that I'm very proud to be involved with and you know something out here on the west coast i'm in ohio but i come out here as often as possible i also started um, something called project zoo book which is my pride and joy and i'm the co-founder of that and what that is is it's a group that is working together of bigfoot researchers alongside different scientists across the United States. So as of right now, we have primatologists, anthropologists, zoologists, we have um, wildlife biologists, a wildlife veterinarian. We just added a marine biologist. So even though she you know, looks at things like whales and fish, she's really interested in Bigfoot. She has a really good story about how she became interested in that. So we have conference calls, we get together. Um, two of the primate zoologists came out with me to the Olympic project last year. And I'll tell you a little bit about that if you wanna hear it. But you know, it's just the most fun. And I've learned so much about gorillas and chimps and other primates. You know, there are a lot of different ways that people look at what Bigfoot is. And to me, how what I'm interested in is to see if it's some type of a North American primate. I don't know if that's what it is. I don't even know if it exists, but that's how I look at it. So the Olympic Project it is just a fascinating group of people. Basically, there was a logging company 
that found some ground nests up on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. A surveyor found these and they contacted different people to try to figure out what was making these huge nests that had structure out of huckleberry bushes. And they ended up contacting a friend of mine, Derek Randalls, who is a Bigfoot researcher. And he came out with his, you know, friends and um, fellow researchers that were in his group. And they've been studying these nests for a few years now. And it was just made known very recently that um, something that Project Zoo Book has been, you know, kind of uh, involved in as far as talking to the Olympic Project and kind of coming up with ideas. But um, that some new nests have been found on another ridge in that same area. So they're doing a lot of um, uh, sampling of hairs that were found, DNA testing, um, a lot of audio has been found and they continue to try to capture that and it's very exciting and what I tell people because I understand you know when you say to somebody that you're a Bigfoot researcher or even if you're a Bigfoot enthusiast or whatever you want to call yourself people look at you funny usually <laughs> and I get it you know I'm just a normal person that started getting interested in this but when you tell them that there are scientists that are interested that there are people who are way smarter than I am you know interested in this and we're not the first group of scientists I just want to say that there have been scientists interested in this for way longer than I ever have been involved but it's exciting for me to have these fresh new eyes looking at evidence and looking at things right now did have one other possible sighting. I always tell people that when I go out in the woods, 99.9% .9 of the time nothing happens. I spend a lot of time looking in different states around America, hopefully soon up in Canada, but most of the time you don't have anything that you find and that's okay because you know you see rabbits and deer and I saw a beaver and a moose you know just a few days ago. And that's exciting and a lot of fun to me. And that's one of the reasons that I became a naturalist so that I could, you know, be out there looking for other things. I feel like Bigfoot people, you know, whatever they are, investigators, researchers, or enthusiasts, again, like I said, I feel like they're an untapped source of information for the scientific community because we're out there, you know, we're out in the woods and we might find a new bug or a new fungus where we might not find Bigfoot that day or ever and you have to be okay with that you know I have to be okay with spending this time and maybe never seeing anything but just the chance that these creatures exist keeps me going but I did have one other very compelling experience and so my first one was in 2012 this one was in 2018 I was helping some friends that were putting on an expedition in Southern Ohio and I was with three other people. Two of us saw this and we were looking through a FLIR camera at something very big and very wide again going down a power line cut and we were looking through a FLIR and that's a forward looking infrared camera so you could see the heat signature of this thing. We watched it walk away from us. We watched it disappear over what is an embankment, a very steep embankment, which a person could possibly get over, but this was two in the morning and it's very difficult and it went really fast. So what we did was we had um, the, the other gentleman and myself that had watched this back and forth through the camera. We were separated. We didn't talk for, I think, three weeks and we wrote down everything that we experienced smells sights you know what we what we experienced and we drew pictures of what we thought this thing looked like we right away had put people down at the same area that we first saw it and we knew where it was because there were um you know towers there with the concrete bases and so that was keeping some of the residual heat from the day. So we knew where this, whatever it was, was located. And the 
tallest of the people that we sent down there to stand next to it is a friend of mine who is, I believe, six foot nine. And I'll tell you what, like I've never fainted or anything like that before in my life. But when he stood there and I realized how much smaller he was than what I had seen, I had to grab on to the other guy. Like I felt my knees kind of buckle. And, you know, it it was another moment of my life that I just can't explain. You know, I don't think Bigfoot is supposed to exist because especially somewhere like Ohio or Pennsylvania where I take a lot of reports. I talk to hunters. I go to fishing shows and hunting shows and outdoor shows trying to get people's stories. And I do. I get them. And I just... I don't understand how they could be there. When I come out here to Oregon or Washington, I can see it more with these vast forests. But when you go to Pennsylvania, the Allegheny National Forest, places like that, it's really, really not as hard maybe as you think. Because when you're walking around in there, most of the time you're not going off trail. I found a bug. <laughs> We're camping. Um, and most of the time, you know, there, there's a lot, well, all of the time, there's a lot of land that just isn't explored by people. So I say that it's hard for me to believe it, which it is, but then I've had these experiences that have, have really affected me. And I talk to people who, grown men who will stand there and cry over what they've seen. They won't go back in the woods to hunt. They won't, um, there was one gentleman who was a foreman for a construction crew and he wouldn't go back to work for a few days because of what he saw and his wife said he never missed a day of work in his life before that he knows what black bears look like he knows what's in the forest and he says he saw a bigfoot and he saw it up close i would love to see that i think you know sometimes you want to be careful what you wish for but up until now i've had you know sounds i've heard um i've had a footprint that was found last year when I was camping remotely in Mount Hood National Forest by someone else. Um, I, you put everything together, all the footprint evidence and the vocalizations, which is my favorite to listen to. I love to look at the, you know, the vocalization um, evidence. And, and there's just things that aren't on record. We don't know what's making these. We don't know what's doing it. We don't know what's making those nests. So to think that there's something undiscovered out there, no matter what it is, if it's Bigfoot, how we think about them, or if it's something else, you know, it's something that I feel like I'm going to be chasing after for a long time. After I saw what I saw in 2012, you know, we were going over that bridge and I'm holding my breath looking at it trying to figure out what it was as soon as we zoomed past it and I was a passenger the other the driver did not see it of course but I just yelled I was like I think I just saw Bigfoot because that's what popped into my head you know and I know in pop culture what they're supposed to look like and that, that's what it looked like I called my mom and I'm like mom you're never gonna believe this I I swear it looked just like Bigfoot I don't know what it was I don't you know, it can't be that in my head. It can't be that. So what was it? And my mom being my mom, she's like, I believe you. I believe you, honey. <laughs> you know, um, I was consumed with finding out more because even though even today I say, I don't know what it was. And that is true. I still think that it was a Bigfoot in my head. You know, I, I believe that. Um, I just can't prove it. So that you know, bothers me a bit. But I started reading everything, especially after I did that first Google search. I was like, Meander, Reservoir, Bigfoot, and all these things popped up. And in Ohio, Ohio is one of the top states for Bigfoot reports, you know? And I'm like, what? I don't, I don't understand how this could be. So I read every book. I remember when I was in eighth or ninth grade, I had to write a paper about something I wasn't sure if I believed in. And I did write that about the Loch Ness Monster because I love them. You know, my family, half my family's from Scotland. And I'm like, okay, I don't know. Um, and I remember there was one book in our library 
and part of it had a little thing about yet the yeti or something in there you know i didn't i wasn't reading that i was reading about the loch ness monster and i started read like look looking for books and now you can find all kinds of books you know i could get them through interlibrary loan get them off of amazon or whatever i read everything i could listened to podcasts started looking for people who were talking about this and it's surreal to me now that i go and i talk about it to other people you know a big reason why i do that is every time i have gone to whether it's a library or a conference or whatever and talked about it I've always had somebody come up to me and said I saw one too and can I tell you my story and I feel like it's a good thing for people to tell their stories to be able to share what they've been holding in you know the the hunter that was telling me about how his favorite day even better than Christmas was the opening of deer season and now he can't go because he's so intimidated by what he saw in his field he needed to talk about that. He hadn't talked about it to anybody else but me. And it, it makes me a little emotional because it's something that you're not supposed to have seen. You know, it's not supposed to be real. And yet you saw something and you don't want people to make fun of you. I'm to the point where I don't care if people make fun of me. I, I, I don't exaggerate what I've seen, but I don't say I didn't see it either. So I just want to be a safe person for people to talk to. So right away, I really was obsessed with learning more and learning more. And it, it, it hasn't gone away. I was going to say it's gone away a little bit, but no, not really. I don't spend every waking minute on it anymore, but I spend a lot of waking minutes on it. Um, whether it is taking down other people's reports again, whether it is learning things about a different area that I'm going to go into or doing the historical research which is another passion of mine learning about everybody who's come before me that has you know been a part of the Bigfoot community been a part of looking for this creature and you know what they've added to it I have friends all across the board in Bigfoot Bigfootery if you want to call it that um you know I look at it as a possible animal, but a lot of people look at it differently. And I have very good friends who I have full confidence in that say they, they think it's something more spiritual. Or you have people that think it's an alien or something like that. And, and a lot of times those two different sides push against each other, you know, and say, no, we're right, we're right. I don't know who's right. You know, I'm interested in it as an animal. I think it absolutely could be an animal. But if it ends up being something more spiritual or an alien, then I'm fine with that. I think that would be pretty cool, <laughs> you know. So um, I don't think it has to be, but I think it could be. I don't know. And I'm, I'm fine with saying that. But I spend a lot of time, ask my fiancé, Lester, I spend a lot of time on Bigfoot, whether it's traveling, reading, writing a lot now. I, I spend a lot of time, and thankfully he's very supportive of that. Because when I met him, it was post Bigfoot, you know, I'm already into it. And I told him, you know, you have to be okay with that because <laughs> it's, it's in my heart now. You know, I, I think I said earlier that I feel a little bit like Don Quixote going after those windmills, you know, like on this quest. And it's just a personal quest. You know, people ask me why I do this. Of course, if we were ever to be able to verify that there's a living animal, you would love protection for it. You know, that would be an ultimate goal. There's another part of me that, you know, I want to see it for myself to be 100% sure that they exist. So it's it's something I see myself doing. I, I feel like I'm going to do it for the rest of my life, you know, because it's that much inside my head wanting to know. A lot of my good friends are ghost hunters, you know, and paranormal and stuff. And I even do this um little... Thing for a paranormal podcast for them like Bigfoot stuff but I totally like with ghosts and things I I 100% believe in those like I've seen some things that I know Bigfoot is like couldn't it have been just a little closer but when you talk to people who have had these face-to-face -face sightings and I know we get pranked we get hoaxed 
you know, the, there are times when people like they tell you the story and I'm sure they're laughing a second later that you maybe were believing them, but there's enough that I cannot dismiss. There's enough that I can't dismiss in the news right now. They're talking about UFO activity and things that have been suppressed. And now we're getting to learn about. So if they, whoever they is, the government or whoever they is would come out and say, yes, UFOs are real and maybe some aliens would land and there they are and they're real. I think that for me that wouldn't prove Bigfoot but it would make it a little um, maybe it would make it a little easier for everyone to think it's a possibility. You know it would it would it's such a big mystery and bam there they are you know oh maybe there's other things out there and the the marine biologist that I was talking about she said that she and I believe four other biologists, wildlife biologists, were in a car in Virginia and they saw a mountain lion in the median of the road. So they called the Division of Wildlife or something like that, something official, and said, hey, we saw a mountain lion. They're not supposed to be here. And the agency said, they're not here. Okay. And she said, well, we saw them. No, you didn't. <laughs> and they tried to tell them that it was a bobcat. And she said, no, it wasn't a bobcat. We all saw this. It was a cougar, you know. And then they said, well, it was a golden retriever. <laughs> no, <laughs> it wasn't a golden retriever. You know, she's owned those dogs. Or maybe it was a Labrador retriever. I can't read a dog. And she's like, no, it was a cat. And it was big and had the long tail and everything. And so... Finally, you know, through all of that experience with back and forth and knowing what she saw, she started wondering what else was out there that we're being told doesn't exist because she knew she saw that. So what else is there? And so she's been an awesome addition to Project Zoo Book. Um, I think it's great to have fresh eyes. You know, she's not, she doesn't work directly with primates. So she has these fresh eyes that has just been a, a really great thing to see. Well, Cross River Gorillas were just found, this, like, confirmed this century on video. You know, they, they're um, on the border of Nigeria and Cameroon, and one of the primate guys that's in my group, his, um, uh, what do you call it? I forget what the name is, what the position is at the zoo he used to work at, but he had gone over there looking for them for, I believe, 10 years, looking for these gorillas to prove that they exist. And in that 10 years, he caught sight of them for eight seconds. You know, and that was his job was to be out there looking and he couldn't find them. And he had guides and everything and couldn't find them. But now we have them. We have them. They're real. You know, but people said, no, they're, they're a myth. They're the men in the forest, wild men. You know, but that's just recent. And then you have a new orangutan species that was found recently. You have the billy apes that were found not too long ago. And um, why not here? You know, this is a huge country. All of our Native American tribes say they're here. So maybe they are.